I am going to turn the controls over to George. So welcome, George. Thanks for being here today. Well, thank you very much, Louise. I really appreciate the invitation. It is a pleasure to be here today. Um, let me get the screen maximized here. Okay, you should be seeing my screen now. I hope so. Uh, uh, yes. Louise, can you yes, just... Yes, I do. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Great. All right, then I'm going to minimize this. And, again, thank you for the invitation today. Uh, please do type your questions in chat as we go along, and um, I won't be able to catch them with the uh, dialog box there closed, but Louise is going to catch them for us. And we've got a couple of spots in here where we'll break, uh, and you can. Uh, we will ask the questions then. We'll try to uh, answer them as best I can. We'll have three parts to this program. The first one is tips for new leaders accidental leaders as I call them. Uh, we'll also have a section on some pitfalls to avoid. And then the last section, which may seem uh, a little strange to add to a program on the accidental leader, but that's how to be a courageous follower. And I think it fits in really nicely with the topic that we're talking about today. So as librarians, as a, as a defrocked English major and reference librarian, a great way to start is always with Shakespeare, right? And I love this quote from Twelfth Night that, be not afraid of greatness, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and others have greatness thrust upon them. But I have to tell you, the, I think the bard was wrong. Um, most leaders really aren't born. They're shaped by their upbringing, uh, by the circumstances in which they find themselves, by education, by their faith experience, and by experience of all kinds. Here are three of my absolute favorite quotes regarding leadership, and I'm not going to read them to you. I'm just going to pop them up here. Um, I was honored at one point uh, to meet Grace Hopper. She was, uh, I don't know if you know her or not, but she was one of the inventors of the original computers in the 1940s that were used during World War II to figure out at what angle uh, howitzers and other types of ordnance should be fired in order to have maximum effect. And she was one of the, the great great uh, advocates for computer programming and especially for getting more women involved in computers. And uh, in fact, she's the only person I think I met in my entire life who only got to meet her, but she was also on the David Letterman show. Peter Drucker, of course, the great management guru, um, has, has these thoughts on management. And finally, Stephen Covey, uh, who talks about leadership and management. And I think it's really important very early in this program to make one really important point, and that is both leadership and management are vital to the effective operation of any organization. Leadership without management tends to lead to chaos, as you can see by the center flying apart. Uh, leadership that doesn't involve management can create a sort of a situation where people don't know where they're going, they don't know what they're doing, they can't get the backup that they need in order to, to be successful. On the other hand, management without leadership tends to lead to institutional rigidity. You need both parts. So the, although this program is called the accidental leader, we can't minimize the importance of good, solid management. And both, both people and things need to be brought along. But, uh, procedures need to be in place as much as inspiration needs to be in place. We can never minimize the importance of good solid management to go along with leadership. So how do we make the, the difference here? You know, some people love Game of Thrones or, or Sons of Anarchy. Some people are Dr. Whovians. Uh, me, I'm a huge fan of the late lamented series Mad Men. This series, if you, if you don't know about it, and I don't know how you could possibly live in the United States for the last 10 years and not know about it, but it's about an advertising agency in New York City during the early 1960s. And the difference between leadership and management is really clearly delineated in these two characters, uh, at, at least in the way they were described in the first couple of uh, seasons of the series. Um, Don Draper is the creative genius in the agency. He imbues the people who work with him with, with kind of an overriding sense of mission. And, and he sees things that other people don't and can empower other people then to act on his vision. He gives them the tools that they need to succeed, uh, even though he'd probably never phrase it like that. Now, 
he also skips internal meetings, he has no idea about how the billings work, and he, has, uh, he, he really doesn't know what everybody else in the agency is doing at any given time. On the other hand, Joan Harris is the incredibly efficient office manager for the agency, the indispensable manager who knows where everything is stored, both in filing cabinets and uh, between people's ears. She knows the nuts and bolts of how the agency runs. She knows where the bodies are buried, but she has no role or interest in the history or direction of advertising as a business or a profession. Um, this changed, like I said, as the series evolved, but in the beginning, the contrast between these two characters was stark. So, before we really get started, we need to state a few more important facts. The first one is most librarians, that's most people who get the MLS degree, are going to be in charge of something someday, probably sooner than they expect. For the last few weeks, I've been reading applications for the Library Leadership Ohio program, uh, which will be happening again this summer. It's been an ongoing leadership program for librarians in the state. And I, I'm amazed at how many of the letters of application say, I've been in the field a year and a half and I'm now running a branch library, or uh, I was here and my my, my, uh, my supervisor went on maternity leave and so I was responsible for the six-person department for four months. Uh, people who are right out of library school, people who are new to the profession, sometimes people who come over to librarianship from another field, but they're getting serious responsibility early in their careers. Second really important premise is the world needs great leaders, it needs great managers, and it needs great followers. Whether you want to be a leader, a manager, or a follower, learn the craft. In fact, it's probably important that you learn all three crafts because at different times in your life, you're going to end up playing each of those roles. Your job is to play each role really well. And again, today's program is going to focus on leaders and followers rather than managers. There are lots of other programs on, on management out there, uh, and so I want to focus on these things today. Too many people think that leadership only happens when somebody's anointed with a title and a fancier workspace. But really, nothing could be further from the truth. We've all known people with big, important titles and big, important offices and big, important salaries who couldn't lead a cat to a litter box. And we've all known people who can just naturally lead other people to do all sorts of things. On the, on the positive side, I think of my six-year-old granddaughter. Um, she is so good at corralling groups of other kids, uh, and she does it almost naturally without, I mean, she does it better than some teachers I've seen. She can get kids to, to play the, in the direction she's interested in playing. I've seen her take groups of kids who were really unruly and get them to sit down and um, watch a video with her while their parents were shopping. It's really kind of amazing. But on the negative side, you can also see leadership turn into something almost insidious, like a cult of personality or a destructive political movement or a four-year presidential campaign. Not that I'm being political in any way, shape, or form. All right, let's move on. Real leadership, real, excuse me, real leaders take on their leadership roles with or without the formal vestments of authority. Sometimes this is a moral leadership like, like Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks or Corazon Aquino or uh, Malala Yousafzai. But it doesn't have to be this dramatic. Sometimes it's a very situational leadership. It can be someone who takes leadership in an automation project in a library or when there's a sudden disruption in the regular workflow, a disruptive individual in the library or uh, somebody get, who gets sick before a really important event. Um, Somebody, sometimes it's a situation where somebody gets fired and other people have to pick up the reins and keep going. This kind of situational leadership is much more common and, uh, than the kind of moral leadership that we see coming out of people like, uh, like the big heroes that I mentioned. If ever there was a time that proves the rule that talk is cheap, it's when someone pretends to be a leader by talking his or, way through it, his, his or her way through it without actually um, doing the work. Leadership is about how you behave, not about what you say. So what do we mean? So, so, so here's some metrics you can use to measure how successful leadership really is. The first one is how do you treat people? How does this, this leader, and I'm, you can't see me using air quotes here, but how does this leader treat other people? 
Does he or she ask other people to do things that they won't do themselves? Do they behave in an ethical manner? Is their word their bond? Do they have a sense of humor? Can they handle stress and a whole lot of things happening at once without getting crazy or grumpy or unapproachable? Are they committed to what they're doing or are they, or are they always looking for an escape hatch? And finally, do they show some self-confidence? Now, I'm not talking about arrogance here. I'm talking about confidence. Confidence in their ability to get the job done, to work with you, and to, to lead uh, effectively to a desired conclusion. I think it's kind of interesting that you can learn a lot by watching how a bad leader behaves, too. Some of the most important lessons I've learned over the years came from watching some of my bosses who were that uh, the type that couldn't lead the cat to the litter box. Um, I had a boss who was so incredibly political that you couldn't ask her what she had for breakfast until she checked the polls. Um, I had another one who uh, had a very tumultuous personal life and was constantly bringing it into the office and driving everybody crazy with it. Um, and so you, you can actually learn, okay, I never want to do that. I, and I think one of the biggest lessons I ever learned was um, I kind of had a hair trigger temper sometimes. And I was in the gym. In fact, it was while I was living in Illinois. I was in Park Ridge, in the gym in Park Ridge. And I was just, you know, working out on the elliptical trainer. And next to me was a gentleman on a, a stationary bike. And he was pedaling to beat the band. All of a sudden, it stopped working. And he got off, and he started looking at it, and he started tinkering, trying to play with it. And he flipped it over, and he played with the chain, and it wasn't working. And he just kicked the crud out of it. And I went, what an idiot. And then I thought, this is how you look when you lose your temper. So I have tried ever since then. It's been more than 25 years since I lived in Park Ridge. But I always think of that when I think I'm about to lose my temper. You don't want to look like that guy. So one of the most important things you have to know when your leadership happens is don't panic. Relax. Basically, most people want you to succeed. They want the organizations in which they work or that they're the trustees of to survive and to prosper. And they'll generally help you if they're asked. Also, try not to take everything so seriously. We're working in libraries, not emergency rooms, not nuclear silos. We're working in libraries. It's a great job. It's a fun job. But put it in perspective. As my colleague at OCLC used to say, um, no one ever died of bad cataloging. I think that's an important rule for us to keep in mind. So what I'm going to be talking about in, for the next session, section of this program as I'm talking about the tips for new leaders is th these are tips for people who maybe are in their first professional job. Maybe it's something they really wanted and they finally got it, or maybe it's something that um, it happened to them. As I said, their, their boss went on maternity leave and they were asked to take over for a, a period of time. Or somebody died or got fired. Or they're in a situation where they're leading a project and they've never done that before. Those are the kinds of people I refer to as accidental leaders. Some people set out with a, a very clear career plan. I never did that, but I know people who do that. I'm going to do this for several years, then at this, that point I'm going to become a department head, or at that point I'm going to start working toward tenure, and then down the road I'm going to be a director, I'm going to be the head of a library, but I'm going to be a branch manager, whatever it is, and they set out with a very clear plan. But sometimes it just falls on you. It's sort of like what Harry Truman said when uh, Franklin Roosevelt died. The reporters were around him and, and they said, uh, Harry, what do you want? And, they, Harry, and Harry Truman said, boys, if you're praying men, pray for me because I feel like a bale of hay just fell on me. And so I, I think sometimes new leaders feel that way. So these tips that I'm going to provide, they're not in any kind of order other than how I thought of them as I was writing the program. You don't need to do all of them, and you don't have to do them in any specific order. This is not uh, an eight-step program to happiness that you have to follow like the, the Arthur Murray steps on the floor. But I do think that all of these can be useful to new leaders who are trying to feel their way through this unfamiliar country. My first tip is to get to know yourself. 
Uh, I recommend taking one or more of these kind of self-understanding tests that we all know that are available. You can take some or all of these tests or at least a reasonable knockoff online for free. There's, of course, the, one, the best known one, which is what you're looking at right here, which is the Myers-Briggs type indicator, which, you know, are you in uh, an I an introvert or an extrovert, a sensing or an intuitive, and, and those sorts of things. There's also the Enneagram, which has a more um, uh, kind of a, uh, it has a somewhat more spiritual aspect to it than the Myers-Briggs, but kind of gets you to the same point. There's the Berkman method and there's the DISC method, and they both have uh, ways of doing kind of a self-examination to understand yourself better. Another one, and oh, by the way, there's links to all four of those uh, that you can do at, on the last slide of this uh, slide deck, which Louise will be posting on the Rails website after the program is over. Another one that you want to look at is Strengths Finder 2.0 by Tom Rath, which was published by the Gallup people. Well, it's been about nine years now that it's been published, but it's a very strong, useful way of thinking about how you work. Uh, a couple of caveats with this. The, the most important one is personality tests are not destiny. Just because you come out an ENSF or whatever doesn't mean that that is the way you must behave. This is not like Minority Report where it, uh, you, know, you can predict exactly what your behavior is going to be because of how you fall on these various uh, uh, continuum. I can't stress this enough. It, it really is important. And that's one of the reasons why I mentioned Strengths Finder by Tom Rath. That book focuses mainly on what the what you do well instead of trying to constantly remediate the things you do poorly. And it, it has a list of 39 strengths, and you find out what your top strengths are and how you can use those strengths to do what you're doing well and how you can put together teams of people with matching strengths so that uh, things can, can be done well. I think it's important to know yourself in order to understand how you think and how you react, not to give yourself an excuse to limit yourself or not as a way to put yourself in a personality box that limits you. That's not the point of these at all. The second tip is to get a mentor. Mentors provide insights, they help you discover your own strengths and weaknesses, and they give you another point of perspective. So how do you find a mentor? It can be a lot simpler. You ask. Mentoring can be formal or it can be informal. It can be as simple as getting a business card at a conference and starting an email correspondence or texting back and forth with somebody. Or it can be as complex as a multi-year relationship that starts in school or in your first job or at a leadership event like I Lead USA. And don't forget what I said about watching those bad leaders for ideas and what to avoid. You could consider these people your bizarro world mentors, if you will. Tip number three is develop your networks. Everyone needs people to rely on, and it makes sense to have multiple networks. That's why I use the plural there instead of the singular. Most people want to have a network of library peers, people who have similar background and interests and who can converse knowledgeably about library concerns. And there's lots of ways to do this. You can do it through your association. You can do it through the regional library system. You can do it through your alumni group at your library school or, or uh, all sorts of different ways you can you can do that. There are folks you might meet on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter. You might find them on PubLib or some of the other listservs that still exist. You might find them at conferences, on committees that you work on for various organizations, um, or again, it might be in your graduating cohort from library school. But you also want to have a civilian cohort, people who may be leaders in the community or who may be in a Facebook group or a LinkedIn group who can provide you with an outside view of our sometimes hermetically sealed world. Um, and these can pay benefits in unexpected ways. For example, the city manager here in Delaware, which is uh, uh, where I work now, just sent me a really interesting article on library technology from his International City County Managers Association magazine, which I never would have seen. And that helped us start a conversation back and forth that um, I hadn't had with him because we're not a city agency, we're a, a, an independent district. So it started to establish that contact. Um, you, will, you can also develop networks in all sorts of ways, and this is not something that's limited to people with an MLS after their name either. Uh, whether you're working in a circulation department or whether you're working in children's services, whatever you're doing, you can find 
cohorts, uh, people who are peers who are doing similar things in libraries through Facebook, through the associations, and it's very useful to, to have those, uh, those groups. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about why it's so important when we get into the second half of the, or the second section of the program. My fourth tip this morning is to ask a lot of questions. And there's, there's a number of reasons why you want to ask lots of questions. First, assuming that you are an accidental leader, there's a whole lot you really don't know. Pretending that you can know it all or that you can do it all can severely undermine your credibility. So I have to tell you right up here, I'm not a real fan of the concept of fake it till you make it. I'm much more a fan of build it till you make it. Credibility is your currency as a leader, not omniscience and certainly not power. It's the, that believability that you have. Second, asking a lot of questions is a good sign of respect. It's a sign of respect for the people you're leading and it's a sign of respect for your boss. Getting to know your coworkers as human beings is a great way to show empathy and to understand their challenges and aspirations. And if your boss that you're reporting to is any kind of a human being, he or she will respect the fact that you are asking them as a senior person to help you with the questions that you have as a new leader. And the third reason this is important is it's a good way to start your mentoring relationship or to bring new people into your network. The best conversations in my life have frequently started with simple questions about the work I do or questions I ask them about what they do. I remember that um, I was asked to take a new employee at OCLC out to lunch. He was somebody who was coming in from the graphics arts and computer world and he was going to be working in the communications area at OCLC. And I was asked to take him to lunch. And we, we sat down at lunch at, uh, I think it was a Bob Evans restaurant actually, and the first question he asked me was, what does a library without books look like? And that was it. We were off to the races. We've been friends now for probably a dozen years, all because of that first conversation. Uh, and I think asking good questions is a great way to get those, uh, uh, those mentorship relations started and also to learn what you need to know to be the manager, or the leader, excuse me. Oops, helps if you hit the right button. This one seems so obvious, I almost didn't include it. But this is one of the concepts that can't be stressed too often. Leaders are constantly replenishing their storehouses of knowledge in order to have something new to bring to the table. So, what are some of the good sources of continuing education information? I'm going to list some that I think here, but if you have some you'd like to share, please put them into the chat box, and uh, I'm sure people would love to know about these. Uh, the first one, of course, is your regional library system, but I guess I don't have to tell you about that because you wouldn't be here if you didn't already know about your region. Okay, I'm going down a rabbit hole here. All right. Let's move on to other groups. There's the state associations. The Illinois Library Association has a lot of uh, good programming, conferences, and other, other events that you can use. Um, state libraries, uh, at least when states have a budget, have an opportunity, I'm sorry, that was an, a nasty dig at Illinois and I apologize. Um, but, but state libraries generally have a lot of good, good information to offer, uh, webinars, in-person uh, events, continuing education. Uh, ALA and, and PLA, I I'm, know I'm, personally I'm really looking forward to the PLA conference coming up in April uh, because it's a great time to, number one, meet with some of my mentors and, and some of the people I've mentored over the years and also to learn new things from other libraries that are doing incredibly interesting and innovative things. Web Junction uh, has traditionally been a good source of, of continuing to education and information and new ideas. The library schools uh, have been starting to get more and more into continuing education. It wasn't an area they did for a long time, but they seem to be moving more into that now. But I think we also have to remember that there's a lot of non-library related news sources and information sources that we can use and take the things that are talked about there and apply them to library work. Uh, a couple of them that come to mind are the Khan Academy, um, TED Talks. I love TED Talks. When I've got 15 minutes at the end of the day and I just you know, want to kind of decompress from the day, you just go to the TED Talks, you can find all sorts of fascinating information uh, through them. And it doesn't have to have anything to do with books or literacy or technology. Sometimes just hearing somebody who talks about a challenge that they've overcome or a way that they created something or their reaction to something in their environment will spark an idea in you that you can take forward. 
Um, I also love the Harvard Business Review, which is kind of strange because I have no business background to speak of. But um, the, the Harvard Business Review has a number of um, blogs and regular uh, newsletters that they provide free of charge that you can subscribe to. And again, the link for that and for some of these other things is on the last panel of this presentation. So I, I think you have to take those non-library related news sources pretty seriously because we tend to get tunnel vision in our field. We focus so closely on libraries that we forget how much we're affected by the rest of the world. We also forget sometimes that the same people who use supermarkets, doctor's offices, ATM machines, um, who use um, Facebook and Twitter and Amazon and Instagram and Snapchat and all those other things are also the people who are using our libraries. And what they see and experience there has an impact on what they expect from us. So by seeing the ways the rest of the world is changing and transposing those themes into the key of library, we can bring fresh approaches to implementing outside ideas within our profession. All right, I'm not only a Mad Men fan, but I'm also a trekker. Sign me up for Nerds Anonymous. But diversity isn't just about equal opportunity laws. You know, diversity is about bringing the, and that's one of the things I loved about Star Trek. It was, except for the fact that on the original one, that the only African American was the lady who answered the telephone, which I, is a line I stole from the Big Bang Theory. Uh, as, it, as it evolved, it became a more diverse program. And diversity isn't just about equal opportunity laws. Diversity is about bringing the full spectrum of experiences and ideas to bear on the questions and issues you face. Surrounding yourself with people who've grown up in different environments, learned at different schools, or without traditional formal education at all, people who've worshipped in different faiths or have no faith, uh, no, no traditional religious faith, or people who've experienced different life situations will, in fact, enrich your experience. It creates a richer environment that fosters better decision making and more innovation. It's always been my experience that if two people in a management structure always agree, one of them is pretty much unnecessary. The whole issue of work-life balance has come back into the mainstream conversation again with the publication uh, in 2014 of Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In and in 2015 of Unfinished Business by Anne-Marie Slaughter. It, it, this frequently gets framed as a, and again, you can't see my air quotes, as a women's issue or a mother's issue. Instead of being framed as one that affects all of us who are trying to, to balance the need to earn a paycheck with the need to maintain some semblance of sanity. Given our world of always-on communication, the line between work and life can blur pretty quickly. For some of us, that's not a problem. But when work muscles out fun completely, then your work-life balance is starting to get out of whack. A big part of leadership is being able to draw on a large variety of experiences, learning, and personal contacts as you make decisions and try to bring people along on your journey. You owe it to yourself and to the people whom you lead to make sure that your variety is as wide and as deep as possible. And that means having a full life, not just a work life. And finally, it's really important as a leader to share your passion. Martin Luther King did not stand on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on that memorable day in August of 1963 and announce, I have a spreadsheet. The importance of helping people understand why this is important to you, to really know what you believe and what motivates you, can't be overemphasized. This is perhaps the most personal and the most vulnerable part of being a leader, but it's one that's very effective. One of the ways I've found to get this information out, because in many cases it's so deeply ingrained in your own soul, you don't even see it, um, is to do what I call, what I, I, not, I didn't call it actually, Edward R. Murrow called it this, is a this I believe statement or essay. Uh, back in the 50s, uh, Edward R. Murrow, the newscaster from CBS, had a, a short series of programs called This I Believe, in which famous and not famous people would do five-minute essays on their personal belief structure. And it, it wasn't necessarily religious, in fact, in most cases it wasn't, but it explained why they did what they did. In the 90s, National Public Radio, I think it was the 90s, maybe it was the aughts, um, 
National Public Radio revived the series, working with an organization called thisIBelieve.org, logically enough. And again, that link is on the, the, the links page at the end. But when I was working as a consultant, one of, the tr one of the techniques I used was to have people who seemed to be in conflict do a This I Believe statement about what, about what they believed in libraries. And this was very effective in a couple of cases. And I remember one, a, a good-sized public library that we were working with as consultants, and that the director and the assistant director, both brilliant people, were doing good work, but they just weren't communicating with one another. And we had them sit down and write out, on their own, this I believe statements. And when they did that, they both understood better what they were doing. Then when we had them compare the statements, they could both see that they were aiming at the same goals, but they came at it from very different ways. One of them had been a former children's librarian, and her direction was kids. How does this affect the kids? How does this help? children's learning? How does it help them succeed in school and in life? The other person was much more of a, uh, a technologist, and she wanted to know how can we apply the fruits of technology to making the library better, to making the outcomes better. And when they both could see where each of them were coming from, they were able to work much more closely together. I think this is summarized really nicely in a quote from uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the author of The Little Prince, who said, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the people to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. Let's take a little break here. That's the, the, the first part of the program. Um, are there questions? Luis, has anything come across the chat that you want to uh, bring to my attention? Not quite yet, so I'll just um, you know, make a, another quick announcement that if you have any questions for George, to so go ahead and type those into your question box. And um, George, I appreciate the plug for the Rails uh, training program. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, if anyone you know, I, I like that question that if you are finding training elsewhere, even if it's library related or not, um, I'd really like to hear about it and I'd be glad you can type those in the question box as well and I can share those later on with everyone um, if you have suggestions. So, so I think we're good for right now, George. Okay, well then we can, we can push on. Okay. So you might be thinking at this point, um, it can't be that easy. Well, you know, in a way it actually is, but there's also a number of really easy to fall into traps, and I'm going to address those in the next section of the program, okay? And full disclosure here, folks, I'm going to describe eight pitfalls that can ensnare a new leader. I've stepped into every one of these pitfalls by myself, and not always when I was a new leader. You know, it, it, the important thing is that, that leaders aren't perfect, and if they try to tell you they are, watch out, because it's just not a, uh, anybody who thinks that they, they've got it right all the time um, should either be elected pope, where they give you that infallibility thing, or they should be watched because they might be a little sociopathic. We're not perfect. So, but here's the first one. In this one, I think this is, happens to practically every new leader, trying to make everybody happy. Oh my God, there's no mistake that can drive you crazier than this one. Um, and, and let's start out right from the beginning. Trying to make everybody happy is the wrong approach. It's not your job, and you'll drive yourself right out of your mind trying to do it. Your job is to nurture a workplace where success can happen, to make sure that people have the tools they need to be successful, and to create a positive environment where people can thrive. The people themselves are responsible for their own happiness. It's not your job. It's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to clear the way out so that nothing that you're doing creates unhappiness necessarily, but your job is not to make them happy. Your job is to make sure that your loyalty stays focused on the mission of the organization. Now that might sound cold, but if you've developed your vision in conjunction with the people you're, you're leading or have an ex expressed that clearly, it should be obvious to everyone. The other part of this is you got to be careful that you can't. You, you have to realize that you can't be everybody's friend. 
This is especially true when the accidental leader has been promoted to lead the people he or she used to work with. I remember when I was very young, uh, when I'm very young, probably a teenager, there was a TV series called Arnie, and uh, nobody remembers this except me and my wife, I think, and my wife's never forgotten anything. Um, and this series was about a guy who worked on a loading dock who gets promoted into an executive position and how he balances his old buddies that he used to go bowling with and they used to be friends with with the, the suits in the executive suite that he also has to work with now. And there are very few TV shows about this kind of working relationship. And I found it, even at you know 14 or however old I was when it came out, I found it really interesting that this could be an issue. And it is. Uh, I, I know that people, it, you can end up being uh, accused of playing favorites if you're promoted over your, your, your friends or your former colleagues, or you can be accused of tur turning corporate. Again, you have to remember that your loyalty has to be with the mission of the organization. You, you, you're not heartless, you have to realize that people are still human, and you still want to have friends and relationships, but you, you, at work, you have to be focused on that goal of the, of, of the goals of the organization. The second pitfall is making assumptions, especially about other people's motivations. So how do you avoid making assumptions? Well, the first thing is don't confuse can't with won't. Sometimes people put up resistance to doing something you want them to do, where you want them to take a certain direction, and they fight you on it. And sometimes they're fighting you on it because they feel like they can't do it. They don't understand it. They don't have enough training. They don't have enough resources. But what can look like just recalcitrance on the part of the staff is actually just fear that they can't, they'll get so far out, uh, get into the deep end and discover that they can't really swim. The second one to avoid making assumption is don't confuse incompetence with malice. I've seen people who've fallen down on the job and they get accused of doing it intentionally when in fact it really was that they they did go along and discovered they got so far and just didn't know what they were doing. They didn't have enough information or they didn't have enough resources or they didn't have the right training. And don't assume incompetence or malice, don't confuse can't or won't without evidence. And the way you get evidence is don't guess, ask. Have those open channels of communication so that when you're, you're moving forward, you're not trying to understand and read the tea leaves about why somebody's acting the way they are. You can ask them hey, I see this hasn't been done yet, what do you need? Where do we need to go in order to get X done? The third pitfall is the bunker mentality. If people start criticizing you, you can start to feel like you're in a bunker and everybody is attacking you from all sides. A few things you need to do here. First, you need to realize that not everyone is really against you. Okay? Again, like I said earlier, most people really do want you to succeed. Not everyone is really against you. And in order to understand that is the second point. Activate your network to help you gain some perspective. Talk to other people. If you're a new director, talk to other directors. If you're a new branch manager, talk to people either in your system or even in comparable systems who may have been through a similar situation. Use that network, and, and you might talk to, um, if you're a member of the Rotary Club or a church group or uh, other sorts of organizations that give you civic contacts that aren't in the library world, you can talk to them too, because things that happen in the library don't necessarily um, happen in a vacuum. People who run fast food restaurants or doctor's offices or um, trucking companies have recalcitrant employees too. How are they dealing? So the th this all leads to the third point, which is get out and move around. Spy novelist John le Carré once said, a desk is a very dangerous place from which to view the world. If you're only seeing things from your own perspective, then, and from your office, from, your, uh, from, the, from the, the people immediately around you, you're not getting the full picture. And finally, remember that everyone is in this together. A couple of years ago, there was an article in Newsweek that described the constantly evolving relationship between President Obama and his then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And this is the quote from the article. In the beginning, she would say, they want this, they want that, meaning the White House. It took a while for her to start saying, we. Okay, so what you want to do is create an environment of we, where the bunker is replaced by a team of people who are all pulling in the same direction. Then, 
when they're when the when things start to go hinky, you're all going in the same direction instead of feeling like it's all coming in on you, which leads to pitfall number four, which is burnout. You're not Superman, let alone the human torch. You can only push yourself so far. When you start to feel like your time's no longer your own, or if there's no time for your friends or family, or if you're going home every night so exhausted that all you can do is collapse into a warm bed and a cold martini, you're a candidate for burnout. You know, for me, the, the, the first symptom of burnout is when I start to lose my sense of humor. For you, it might be a lack of interest in things you usually enjoy, whether it's cooking or Game of Thrones or your cat or mystery novels or golf or whatever. One remedy for burnout is to remember that the world is not really resting on your shoulders. Burnout frequently stems from that bad perspective I was talking about in the last slide. You begin to think that you have to do everything yourself, that you don't have anyone around you who can be trusted to carry out the organization's mission. If that's true, I hate to say it, but you might want to consider resigning. Part of your job as a leader is to ensure that the whole organization does not revolve around you, that your team has been developed to the point where they can pick up when you're gone. If you really don't have anyone else who can pick up when you're not around, the other thing, you don't necessarily have to resign, but maybe, maybe what you've done is set your goals too high. You have to be realistic about the capacity of yourself and your team to accomplish the goals and objectives that you've set out. The next pitfall is impossible standards. When you're the leader, there's a strong temptation to closely monitor and interfere with how people carry out their work. And you set the standards so high that Oh, the, only the process that you're using could possibly get them there. Avoid this temptation. Focus on results, not techniques, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that later in the program. Be available to consult with your people and be there to be encouraging and to ask questions, but don't overdo it. This not only frees up your time, it also builds up confidence in your colleagues and your staff members. It helps them be in a position where they can take over if you're not there, if you want to take a week's vacation, if you catch a cold, if you, um, if you just need some you time, you've got it covered. Trying to carry it all on your shoulders and then trying to make everybody else do it exactly the way you would do it is a bad combination. Another thing a new leader can sometimes find themselves doing is um, putting up with more garbage from their staff than they should. I've seen this happen more than once. If you're confronted with people who constantly tear you down or who resist you or who are trying to undermine you, you've got several options, but ignoring them isn't one of them. Oh, okay, I'll take that back. Ignoring can be an option if those people are outside your chain of command or outside, your ignore, or you're outside of your organization. Don't let the haters get to you that way. Now, if they're inside your organization and they're still doing that, you've got to find a way to, to, to fix this. And a, there's a couple of options. You co-opt them, or you can isolate and neutralize them, or you can remove them. And again, I know this sounds cold-blooded, but it really does boil down to a few simple options. How do you co-opt people? To me, this is the best way to get, get where you're going, because what you're trying to do is bring people along to your way of thinking. One of the techniques that uh, Joan Fry Williams, who was my consulting partner for a number of years, and I developed was how can we? And this is how this works. You know, we all get the same kind of objections whenever we suggest something new in a library. It might be, we've always done it this way, or we tried that in 1998 and it didn't work, or the board will hate this, or Mary in circulation will never do it that way. Or, you know, you, 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 could, you could sit there and write a list of 20 of these objections that happen every time a new idea comes up, right? Nothing surprising in any of that. So, the way we usually react to that is by saying, no, you're wrong. It's not 1998 anymore. You know, computers have changed or whatever's happened. Or, um, yeah, we've always done it this way, but who cares? We've got new opportunities, new options. There's an old thing in martial arts that you don't fight force with force. You don't meet it with force. You, you, you use the force coming at you and use the person's own force against them. So when the question is raised um, and, you, and you're met, met with the reaction that says, but we've always done it this way, or we tried that in 1998 and it didn't work, turn the question back around. You're right. We tried that in 1998 and it was a disaster. It bombed, whatever. 
how can we do it differently in 2016 so that it doesn't? How can we create the program in a way that the board will accept it? How can we do this so even Marion Circulation will be able to make this function and, and, and work with it? How can we does two things. The first is it respects the objections that are being raised. So many times the people who are actually objecting, when they're playing devil's advocate or whether they're, they're, they're always kind of recalcitrant about these things, it's because they're, they're failed optimists. They did try it in 1998. It didn't work and they, looked like, and they felt like they looked stupid. They don't want that to happen again. They don't want the rep library's reputation to be damaged. So by honoring and respecting the, 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 the objections that they're raising, you bring them into the conversation instead of leaving them out of it or instead of ignoring it or under, undervaluing it. The second thing it does is it changes an objection from being a roadblock to being a design consideration. So how can we make this proposal better is really what you're saying. That's a way to co-op people. You bring them into the discussion. You make them feel like they're part of it, you, and then you move forward. And then if they still fight back, even when their objections have been addressed and, and respectfully dealt with, if they still don't want to do it, then you can offer them, this is the route we're taking. I really want you to be part of this. Will you help? If they won't, then it's time to move on to the second part, which is to isolate neutralize, if you will, them. And maybe that means they don't get the good assignments. They don't get the, the committee assignments that they want. Maybe it's you bringing in people who are actually willing to try the new things as opposed to people who are going to throw their bodies in front of everything. Uh, and sometimes it really is the only way out is to, is to, to terminate somebody. I've, I've, uh, I know this is difficult in uh, collective bargaining or civil service arrangements, but I've been in too many situations where I waited too long to fire somebody who desperately needed it, uh, who was actually a one-person uh, obstacle to getting progress done. And that the thing I, I hated the most, that I feared the most actually in firing somebody, was actually the thing I needed that was the most healthy. It's, it's not unlike having to go through surgery in order to cure something. The surgery is bad, but having the disease is worse. Whatever path you take, and no matter how much you may dislike confrontation, ignoring insubordination is not a good idea. The ripple effects can be huge. You can get to the point where your best ideas and your directions are ignored, your best efforts are undermined, and your best staff will start to say, if she doesn't care, why should I? Pitfall number seven is responsibility without authority. I love this cartoon from the New Yorker, by the way. Be careful to neither accept responsibility without authority from a higher up, nor to delegate responsibility without giving the, the necessary authority that that person needs to carry out the assignment. You need to have both to be successful. This is one of the ways those impossible standards I mentioned earlier come in. One of the mistakes a rookie leader can easily make is to try to micromanage the way in which people carry out the tasks that need to be done. You need to be generous with advice and time, but miserly with direction. Also, listen carefully when you receive direction from your supervisor. Make sure that he or she is giving you the authority you need to carry out the directions. For example, if needed, make sure that you have the authority to improvise in the plan so you don't have to follow it in lockstep. You have to make sure that you have the authority to make assignments to the people you'll be working with and to do course corrections as necessary. And here's the one that, that's a real killer, and I see this all too often, and that's trying to go it alone. The idea that it's lonely at the top is a self-fulfilling prophecy, and it can poison the entire leadership experience. It's only lonely at the top if you let it be. Please don't do that. Reach out. Meet with people, talk to people, get their experiences, listen to them. In all probability, there's nothing that you're going to face in your leadership experience that someone hasn't faced before. And even if there is a unique situation, having a network of other leaders, either within the field or outside of it, will give you a wealth of parallel experience to draw on. Loneliness as a leader, as I said, is nearly always self-inflicted. And it doesn't have to be. We have so many channels of communication, so many opportunities to reach out to other people that if we, if we let those go by and we start to feel like Atlas carrying the entire world on our shoulders, it truly is self-inflicted. We need to be willing to make those um, 
those calls, make those, write those emails, write those uh, those texts in order to get the perspective we need from other people. I, I think a lot of people fear leadership because they fear being in this position, and they don't have to be. Leadership can be a joyous experience if you if you're working as part of a. a, a a successful team with lots of outside contacts when you feel like you're an important part of a bigger thing. So those are my pitfalls to avoid. Uh, let's move on to see if we have questions. Hi George, no we have no questions so I imagine you're being very thorough in your um, explanations of everything. It's, it's so. either that or you're the only person who can actually hear me. <laughs> so, well, um, I don't think so but but um, <laughs> but no just just you know I'll, I'll do another sh oh, no people are saying they can hear you so I'll just okay, put good. another note out there you know if you have questions please share those at any time. So, okay. Thanks. And we will have time at the very end, and we're about to go into the third session, the section of this session. Uh, I'm going to put my eye teeth in backwards this morning. Can't see what I'm saying. Anyway, let me move on here. So, at this point, uh, after w everything I've said so far, you may be having second thoughts about the leadership thing completely. And you know what? That's perfectly all right. You may be starting to think that a leadership role is not for you at all. Don't worry about it. That's okay. Because as I said earlier, the world needs leaders and it needs followers. Ira Chalop's book, The Courageous Follower, has been a real eye-opener for me as I thought about the changing nature of leaders and followers. In my own career, I bounce back and forth between the two roles fairly regularly. And, and Chalop has helped me to understand where I'm doing it right and where I need to do things differently, how I need to rethink my own behavior. I think there's something that you have to hear right at the beginning because it's all too easy to think the wrong way about a follower. Chalif says, follower, and again, this is a direct quote from his book, follower is not synonymous with subordinate. A subordinate reports to an individual of higher rank and may in practice be a supporter, an antagonist, or indifferent. A follower shares a common purpose with the leader, believes in what the organization is trying to accomplish, wants both the leader and the organization to succeed, and works energetically to that end. All right, let's see. There we go. Leaders and followers work together to accomplish the purpose of the organization. Together they create a virtuous, mutually fulfilling circle of action. You can't have leaders without followers any more than you can have authors without readers or chefs without diners. Chalif described five dimensions of courageous followership in his book, and I'd like to introduce those here one by one. But before we move forward, I have to stress again that I've not demonstrated all of these dimensions of courage in my career. There have been times when I didn't act in a courageous manner, and I'll own up to those as we go through here. And you know, I, I won't put you on the spot, but think about these as we're moving forward. There are times when you probably acted really courageously, and there's other times when you think maybe you could have acted in a different way. Kayla's first courage is the courage to assume responsibility. And what this means is understanding that the success of the organization and of yourself rests in your own hands. It means that you need to develop a mutualistic approach to your role in an organization, not a paternalistic view of the leader as the person who, or maternalistic, the person who takes care of everything and you just follow along in lockstep. It also means that some outside you have to realize that some outside party is not controlling your destiny. Assuming responsibility may mean initiating action that supports the mission, even without explicit authority from the leader. Your permission derives from the value of the mission to the organization, so you're willing to take things on. I'm always reminded of one of the first stories that came out of FedEx, and as you all know, FedEx promises to when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. And I remember a story about a guy who, who was working for FedEx, and he was not a, a manager or a supervisor or anything, but he was working in their, their uh, warehouse and um, transfer station in Memphis, and a package fell off uh, somehow, a truck or a loading thing or something, and missed its plane. This guy found the package, found another way, which included chartering a plane to get it to its destination so that it could be there absolutely positively overnight. Now, in some organizations, the cost of chartering that plane would have got, cost this guy his job. But 
FedEx used that as a story for the organization to say that this gentleman had assumed responsibility and a willingness to actually make that happen because he felt a personal responsibility to having the FedEx meet its own stated goals. There's nothing wrong with the concept of service. I've had some really interesting arguments over the years with people about whether or not libraries are a service industry. I don't see any way that we are not a service industry. We provide a service to the public if we're working in public libraries. Uh, we provide it to faculty, students, and staff researchers in a university setting. We're a uh, service to the corporation if we're in a special library, to the, to the students in the, in the school district if we're in a school library. We're a service organization. And to be a courageous follower, it's important to understand that you're serving the purpose of the organization for which you work. And this, sometimes it means taking some of the burden off of the, the leader, even if it's not in your job description. It also means looking for ways in which your strengths complement the leader's shortcomings so that you can complete that virtuous circle I was describing earlier. Are you willing to stand up for what's right? Can you help guide someone who's come off the rails back on uh, without being judgmental or hostile? If you have the courage to challenge, you're willing to risk temporary discomfort for the sake of the longer, health, longer term health of the organization. This is one where I think I, I probably did not act as courageously as I should have. Back in the 90s, I worked for the Ohio Library Association, and we had a, an executive director who I was very fond of. She was a, a friend of mine for a number of years before I started working there. Um, she had given me a really interesting job when uh, I needed one, and we worked together very well. But there was an ongoing fight between her and the board about um, lobbying. She wanted to do it. The board wanted them to hire an outside lobbyist. And for about a year, they were just going back and forth over this. And I. I encouraged the, the director to do what the board said because I'd worked for a board before. I said, you know, they have the ultimate authority. This is not going to end well. Uh, you know, you might really want to think more clearly about doing this. And I, I could not convince her. And she got fired. And I always have wondered if I did enough to head off what happened to her. Did I challenge enough? Did I, did I really try to bring my experience to bear on her? So I'll never know for sure. Uh, but it's something that I've thought of a lot over the years when I've been in other positions and I've had to, uh, to challenge something that my boss or, or my board president or others have thought. You have to have the courage to participate in transformation, but you, the, the, the other side of this is that you also have to have uh, the willingness to stick with it. When times call for a change, a courageous follower stays with the change, supporting the leader and helping the rest of the team see the long-term goal more clearly. A courageous follower has what James Carville, the political analyst, calls sticking, his version of loyalty. Now again, in the 1990s, I had four different jobs. Each one of them, you know, was coming, starting right at the beginning and then at the very end. But I had four different jobs in the 90s. Did I stick with it through tough times and everything? Maybe not. And again, then I followed that, of course, with 16 years at OCLC, so there I stuck. <laughs> this is probably the hardest courage to muster because there are so many facets and considerations to this issue. And I'm just going to mention a few of them. Are you taking a moral stand or are you simply being a self-righteous prig? I've seen people wrap what were really basically um, very idiosyncratic arguments in some sort of a moral cloak that made it seem like it was a, a much more philosophical issue than it was. And it, they just come across as being self-righteous and it's, it's, it's not pretty. Are you defending the principles on which the library was founded or are you simply clinging rigidly to old ways of doing business? Are you sure of your grounds? Do you understand why the leader has chosen a certain course? A difference of opinion does not equal a moral choice, okay? Um, it, it, there, one of the things that we do in libraries is we conflate three things, principles, techniques, and outcomes. 
principles are the core values on which libraries are founded. Things like intellectual freedom, access to information, the, the right of all kids and adults to learn and to grow. We've seen a, an example of that just this week when ALA came out strongly in favor of the letter that Tim Cook wrote from Apple uh, about uh, the, the um, taking out the encryption on that iPhone. Techniques are, are what we do. They're, they're the things that we use to get to outcomes. The outcomes that we have change when the community changes. We're, I'm looking at right now a lot of libraries working on early childhood education, for example, because changes in both the testing uh, rigor and in the funding for schools has changed. So a lot of libraries are taking on the role of working with kids from birth through preschool or school to help them uh, be ready for school, to be ready to learn. And that's a different outcome than we'll, perhaps when we just had story times that were meant primarily to entertain and to start to build lifelong readers. Techniques are what we use to get from the principles to the outcomes. And the biggest fights we have in library are over the techniques. Uh, think about this way. Dewey Decimal System is nothing but a technique. It's, not, it's, a, it's a technique for connecting people with information. But when the Mariposa, Mar Maricopa County Library in uh, Arizona was going to own a branch that was not going to use the Dewey Decimal System, but was going to use the Book Industry Study Group uh, protocols, you would have thought they were taking the books out into the town square and burning them. The reaction was such on the library blogosphere because they conflated the, the technique of using the Dewey Decimal System with the principle of access to information. So we have to be careful that we're, if we're really taking a moral stand, it's over a moral issue and not over a technique, and really not over an outcome. A moral stand can, in fact, uh, if, it, if it actually gets to that, can be a um, very dangerous place to be. If the board of the director is doing something illegal and you can't get them to change their practice, will you get fired if you report it? Maybe. I mean, probably sometimes. Um, but what if it's not illegal and you just don't like what they're doing? Say you think they're the board and the, the, the director are favoring neighborhood or one, um, uh, one course of study over another or putting too much of the library's funding into one service at the expense of another. That's not a moral choice. That is a, a, a management choice. So be careful that you're not confusing a moral stand with just something you don't like. Now, it may have already dawned on you that the courage needed to be a courageous follower is not unlike the courage that's needed to be a great leader. The courage to assume responsibility, to serve, to challenge, to transform, to take moral action, to listen. That this isn't a coincidence. If we see leadership and followership as the drivers to achieve an organization's purpose, it makes sense that these characteristics would work together. And that brings me to another point. For some people, being second in command is a great way to rehearse for the top job. For other people, being a solid consigliere is exactly where they want to be. So I've seen both, and, I, and, and I'm not going to name names, but the person I mentioned earlier who was the assistant director, who was the technocrat, who was um, at odds with the, the director who was more of a children's librarian, is now a director. She was, use, she was in the position, she was using the experience and the learning she was getting as the deputy to become a director. And she's doing a beautiful job. She's great at it. Um, I've seen other people, two, two good friends of mine, who were um, solid librarians working their way through the syst their systems. Uh, both of them became deputy directors, and now both of them are very successful library directors. On the other hand, I've also worked with at least three or four people who were the best second in command you could imagine. Um, and I can mention her name because uh, she's retired from the field, but Bridget Bradley, who was my deputy uh, director at the Public Library Association, was an amazing second in command. She worked wonderfully for uh, Joey Rogers when Joey was the, the head of the Public Library Association, joined her at Urban Libraries Council and did the similar things for the, uh, the, the public library in Washington, D.C. And that was where she wanted to be. She wanted to be an outstanding deputy who actually took the ideas that were kind of formulated by boards and by directors and then made them real. Um, 
the, the gentleman I was mentoring at OCLC who asked the question, uh, what does the library without books look like, is in a similar thing. He likes being the person behind the director who helps the director accomplish what she or he's trying to do and, and make it work. So understand that convergence is, is an important concept, that, that all of this stuff comes together in order to further the goals of the organization. And like I said, those really competent second in commands, those really excellent managers who make things happen, they're the third part of the, conver of the convergence, the leaders, the managers, and the followers. Now, no mice were harmed in the making of this presentation, I just want you to know, but I think we need to realize that there's a role for all of us, those adventurous Tom Cruise style mice and the country church mice alike. But whatever we do requires action, and this is something that I think we, we, we sometimes forget to think about, and that is we can make all the decisions we want, we can make all of the great thoughtful pronouncements we want, but eventually it all boils down into actually doing the work. I worked with a great guy at the American Library Association named Don Wood, and I've, I've asked Don if I can use this story publicly with his name, and he said, oh, I could. So if you know Don, you know what a calm human being he is. He is just the model of somebody you'd want to work with because nothing flusters him, no matter how big the task or how imminent the deadline, he's always together, always composed. And so one day, um, I put that to the test when I was head of public library association by making Don uh, responsible for the committees that we worked with who had four deadlines a year to get things ready for the uh, midwinter and annual conference and the two planning sessions we had each year. Um, and so Don one day storms into my office. Now you, you'd have to know Don, but, but Don never stormed anywhere. Don would sometimes walk with purpose, or he would um, you know, move quickly, but he never stormed it. He stormed into my office, and he said, five crows are sitting on a fence. Three of them decide to leave. How many are left? Well, uh, two? He said, no, five. They've decided, but they haven't done a mm -mm thing, and he stormed back out of my office. I've always thought about that because it's really easy to make decisions. It's really another question to... to, to to make them happen. And so what I'd like to wrap up with is that whether you're born to greatness or whether you've achieved greatness or whether someone has thrust greatness upon you or if you'd really prefer to support someone else's greatness, there's a path that's right for you. The key is to find your own path, not to be backed into a corner someone else has selected for you. Not mom, not your spouse, not the guidance counselor, not the standardized test. None of these things can pronounce your destiny. You have to figure that out for yourself, and you have to have the courage to pursue it. So that about wraps up my prepared remarks. I hope we have some questions or some comments people would like to share at this point. Um, Louise, what do we got? All right. Thanks so much, George. That was really um, a great presentation. A lot of good information there. Um, I don't have any questions just yet, so we've got some time. So if okay. um, people want to, well, you know, take okay. a few minutes. <laughs> so um, I, I do have some suggestions that came earlier about where people find other training opportunities or learning opportunities, and I'll share those. Um, one person said that her local chamber of commerce offers seminars. So I think that's a, a great resource. Some of them also yeah. offer things like a, a leadership program that's specifically tied to the community in which you live. We have a thing here called Leadership Delaware, which is sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce. And it's a year-long program that brings uh, people who run businesses, charitable organizations, not-for-profits, government agencies together to create a cohort of colleagues, but also to expose them to what the community has to offer. And that's a, an incredibly useful program that has nothing to do directly with libraries, but has everything to do with getting the library seen in a different light. Um, another suggestion, uh, in, in our area, Rockford University has a nonprofit management certification program. And um, the person who suggested that said it's a really great opportunity for networking in the Rockford area. So that, that sounds great. And um, the last suggestion was um, seminars presented by Fred Pryor. They're one-day seminars 
Um, an example was making the transition from staff to supervisor, and I guess those those are available in various states. Yeah, they usually oh, take over you. like a hotel room, uh, ballroom, or, or meeting room, and I've been to a couple of those, and uh, depending on the speaker, they can be really, really good, and they have really good materials that you get to take home after them. So I'm actually going to put up uh, my screen here. Uh, i got to close this, I think, first. Um, just because I'll, here's these are the references I was talking about earlier. Um, all of these... Are, like I said, like you see there, I checked them all yesterday. Uh, the online evaluation tools, you can't do a Myers-Briggs trademark version online, but this Human Metrics has a version of it that's very similar to the Myers-Briggs. The Enneagram Institute is more uh, open. They're, they're, they have the, the Enneagram test right there. If you've ever done anything with uh, John, Sh uh, John, Schreiber, John Shannon and Becky Schreiber, they use, that's where I learned about the Enneagram. Uh, we use the Berkman at OCLC as a way of uh, having the managers understand each other better, and, and uh, DISC was used by a leadership program I took a long time ago. But the Harvard Business Review is the one I think that really is surprisingly good. You can get all sorts of things, like a management tip of the day that can show up in your email box every morning. Um, and their blogs are written by professors and the authors who work, uh, who uh, publish with, H, with, with Harvard Business Review, and they have some really interesting uh, material available. Uh, and again, the free of charge. You don't have to subscribe to the magazine or anything to get to that stuff. Okay, great. I do have a couple questions now. Um, okay. One person asked, um, you mentioned not pleasing everyone, um, but what about library boards? And <laughs> kind of a, from the yeah, and from the same person, you know, related to that, um, she asked, can you explain the best way to stand between your your staff and your board? You know, um, do you have any thoughts on those questions? Yeah. Um, your your board is like any other group of seven or ten or eleven or however many are on your board people, and that you've got all of those different points of view, experience, expectations, political desires, uh, all of these things that um, come into play. So you're probably there will be times when you can make all of them happy. Um, a great summer reading program event that brings you know a lot of kids in the community and lots of smiles and lots of uh, good press for the library, good media coverage, lots of nice tweets. That's probably going to make them all happy. When you're trying to decide where to site a new branch or whether you're trying to decide whether to get rid of a medium that nobody's using anymore, you're probably not going to make them all happy. The best you can do in those situations is to make sure that you don't surprise anybody that they don't walk in for a board meeting and discover, for example, that all of the, I don't know, uh, books on audio cassette have suddenly vanished, or uh, you know, some other um, medium is, has replaced them without any kind of uh, advance warning. It's keep, no surprises, and to, to keep them, uh, be transparent about why you're doing what you're doing, and so that you can make the case for the necessity for what you're doing in a way that even if they don't necessarily agree with it, they're not going to actively oppose you. The other thing is to, uh, it doesn't hurt to have champions on the board for things that you want to do. So if you know there's somebody who's particularly interested in one thing, talking to that person, not because they have any authority apart from acting as part of the board, but just because you know they're a human being with an interest in that idea, having that person uh, be uh, uh, an informal advisor or mentor on a project is not a bad idea. They can they can speak then as a peer to the other trustees, without um, uh, you know without holding undue influence. They can use their authority as a trustee to help influence the rest of them. So I think uh, you're you're you are going to have cases where some of the board members are going to love what you're doing and some of them don't. Uh, and the, the trick is to make sure that uh, you always have a majority who still like you. <laughs> Uh, just kidding. Yeah. That that really is that that you, you always really want to have a majority who who still trust you, who think you have the best interests of the library at heart, and are doing things that are going to move the library forward. So I, I think that's that's really important. The second question about how do you stand between your board and your 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 staff? I think that's one of those questions that 
may be posing a false dichotomy. I think what you're looking for is to have everybody pulling in the same direction. Now, I have had, I, I had one of my worst experiences with a board about oh a long, a long time ago. Not at the library where I'm serving now. This is actually several jobs ago. I had a board member. I brought forward an idea for some staff benefit, and I don't even remember what it was. I believe it was no. I actually do remember. It was for continuing education to increase the continuing education budget. And I, I said to the, the board, it was part of the budget proposal, I'm increasing this so that you know, we can get more training into the staff. And somebody said, and one of my board members in an open meeting said, why would you want to train them? We hire them for what they know, we use them up and we get rid of them like tissue. And at that point I knew for one thing, my career wasn't going to be much longer at that library, but I also realized that at that point we were going to have a, <laughs> a, a revolution by the staff. Ordinarily, what you want to do is all, to all be pulling in the same direction. You don't want to necessarily stand between them as much as you want to make a conversation that happens between especially your managers within the library and the board. Um, I've been encouraging, I've been in this position now for almost five months, and for the last couple of months we've been talking about bringing more of the managers to the board meetings so they can hear what the, trans what the discussions in the board are like, what they care about, and they can be there to actually answer questions when a trustee says, you know, what are you going to be doing with um, X, uh, whether it's like we were, we're thinking about some rearrangements of the main library, for example. What, what are you thinking about these things? So we really want to have more involvement with the staff, with the board, so that there can be common understanding. Also, so that when we go out into the community, whether it's a trustee or a manager or a staff person, we're all talking about the same thing, and we're, we're speaking about it from the same page. Uh, you don't want a trustee who's uh, who's kind of a lone ranger on, on some of these topics. You want people who are uh, providing a consistent message to the community. Okay, thanks George. Uh, we do have a couple other questions. Um, do you have any suggestions for how to lead um, when you report to someone who micromanages? Oh, boy, I hate that. <laughs> Um, it's it, that's a, a very tough thing. It really is difficult, and I think the only way to really get around it is to be honest with the person uh, and say, "Hey, you know, you want me to do this task. Let's just say you 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 want me to prepare the marketing materials for the summer reading program." Let's talk about what it is that you want to see happen with the summer reading program. What are the goals you're looking for? Uh, is it increased attendance? Is you trying to win a John Cotton Dana Award? Are you trying to um, get a metric in that we could measure how well kids are ma uh, maintaining their uh, school sc uh, their test scores over the summer? What is it you're trying to accomplish? And then try to get agreement on those ultimate goals and then negotiate check-in. You know, I'm going to check in with you. We're going to have a meeting every Tuesday between now and the, uh, the time the summer reading program launches or the time we have to drop the, the marketing materials or however you want to do this. And, and designate a time almost for the micromanaging. And then part, as part of that negotiation, and then I'll work by myself or I'll work with my team to get it done. And then we'll, we'll check back in with you so that you're never, you the micromanager are never out of the loop completely, you know, that you're not, you'll never feel like you're going to be asked a question that you can't answer. A lot of micromanaging comes from insecurity. Insecurity that um, they're going to be asked a question they can't answer or the people that are working for them are actually smarter than they are. That That's something that fascinates me. I always try to hire people who are smarter than I am because I know what I know. <laughs> I don't know what they know, and I really want to get people working with me who challenge me and who provide, present new ideas. Um, some people can't deal with that. They really feel like they've got to be the smartest person in the room every time. And working for somebody like that is, is frequently why you get micromanaging, because they feel like they, they have to know everything. And if you can convince them that they're getting the information they need so that they won't be embarrassed, you can start to ease that up a little. Um,
but there are some people for whom micromanagement is just a way of life. You know, they, they can't walk by a sign with a misplaced apostrophe without calling the, the manager of the company. So you're, you're going to, you've got to either resign yourself to it, figure out a way to work through it, or maybe start to look for another way, way to earn a living because it can be really frustrating, especially if you do know more than the person. Like I've got a marketing person here who's really, really good. And if I were to tell her, you know, no, we don't want to use that logo on these things or this color is all wrong or uh, I would be shooting myself in the foot. But I know there's a lot of other people who would say, that's your job as a leader. But I don't see that as my job as a leader. My job as a leader is to say yes and to encourage people who are brilliant to do the stuff that they do well. I, I got, I'm got, i surrounded by good people here, and I want them to, I want them to push themselves uh, to, new, to new heights. But they can't do that if I'm sitting over their shoulder saying, no, 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 you've got to, you've got to use this font or you've got to do, you've got to have it in by this date, not the next day because of there's some arbitrary deadline I've set up. Um, so I think really the, the only thing you can do, the, the best thing you can do if you're going to stay in that situation is to try to build a level of trust, whether it's through deadlines or through keeping them in the loop or keeping them in uh, your Google Docs group or however you're communicating with your team so that they never feel like they're, uh, they can be embarrassed. But it's a tough call. It really is working with a micromanager. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I've got three more questions. Um, okay, the next try one not is, to go on so long. Okay. Um, <laughs> what do you do when your manager says he or she has an open door, um, but when you go to them with questions, they, they seem very closed or they're in a hurry to finish up or things like that? <sighs> yeah, they, uh, well, Part of it is to understand that the, the leaders are kind of busy frequently. And even if you have an open door, if you've got something that you really need to discuss with somebody, I would suggest make an appointment, even if they do have an open door policy. Say, you know, I need a half an hour of your time to discuss, again, let's just use the summer reading program marketing materials as, a, as an example. You know, you don't want to show up uh, in their office at uh, a quarter after five expecting a decision, even if they, they do have an open door policy. Um, so that's from your point of view, from you as the employee who's, who's dealing with the leader. From the leader, I think if you're going to tell people you have an open door policy, you got to follow through. As I said earlier, credibility is your currency. And if you tell people you have an open door, but then you sit there with your arms folded across your chest and you're always saying no, having the open door doesn't do a darn bit of good. Uh, if you're going to be a more autocratic leader, at least be honest about it. Uh, don't don't even pretend that you want the, the input from staff. I don't know a lot of leaders like that, fortunately, now. I knew more of them earlier in my career. I think that style of management has kind of petered out. But I think that um, if, you, if, if you're a leader who says you've got an open door policy, you've got, you owe it to the people around you to, to pay attention to your body language, to be respectful of your staff's time, and uh, but uh, in res and reciprocity for them being responsible for your time, uh, or I'm sorry, respectful of your time, and actually act on some of the things that are suggested. Um, you also have to let people know um, if, if you're going to claim an open door policy. If something doesn't happen, you have to let them know why. Um, there was a, similar, a situation like that here at the library the other day. We were dealing with something, and I thought I had a solution, and it turned out I didn't. So I drugged the two leaders, who were the two managers uh, within the company or within the library, who were responsible for this. And I, I said, "Hey, look, we got two ways we can go. What do you think?" Uh, just so that they know we were still following up on it. I hadn't forgotten about what they wanted, but it wasn't going to happen as as they thought. So having that kind of um, ongoing discussion. Uh, I think is really important, uh, and but just understanding that there are demands on both on the time of people who are responsible for working a desk, and for people who are responding to a board or responding to the friends of the library, or whoever. So, um, again, make an appointment if it's something where you really need some time and attention. Uh, if you're the staff person, if you're the leader, pay attention, listen, have an open mind, um, and, and again. 
be honest about it. If um, if if you if somebody if I'm I say I, I do have a I think I have a pretty open door policy here. And if somebody comes in with something and says, "Hey, I need I need a half hour of your time," and I know I've got to run because I've got a, a meeting off site, I'm going to say, "Okay, look, we do need to talk about this. Can't do it now. Let's schedule something. All right, we'll do it tomorrow at 9:30." So um, understand that sometimes, even if you do have an open door policy, you can't always enforce it at that particular moment. Okay. All right. So two more questions, and um, the first one is. Um, do you have the the sentence? The question is not very clear, but I I think that the question is: Do you have suggestions for finding a mentor, or can you can you follow up on that? Um, what you talked about earlier, please. Yeah, um, there's there's so many places, and, and they're not consistent. Um, I, I think the best place generally is to when you're at a conference to go up to the speaker. I, I love this when I'm speaking at a conference. Somebody comes up to me afterwards and says, you know, I'm really interested in what you were saying, but I've got a few questions. Can Do you have time to go for a cup of coffee? Or can I have your card and I can, can I email you or call you and we can talk about this? That can be, you know, maybe it's a one-shot mentoring deal. Other times it's going to actually extend and we're, I'm going to stay friendly with that person as a mentor for a longer period of time. That uh, conferences are probably the best single way to do this. The second way to do it is to use social media well. LinkedIn, which is you know like the business version of Facebook, is terrific for this. Um, you find, and then paying attention, to, uh, getting into the groups within there that you're interested in, and then following up with people who say things that you find interesting or. Uh, illuminating, following up with them and, and having an uh, online or telephone conversation can grow into a mentorship relationship. If you're still a student, find the professor that really, uh, or, or adjunct or, or instructor who makes sense to you, who seems to have a, um, a depth of knowledge that you'd like to dip into and follow up with them. It, some people have uh, and occasionally they will tell you, hey, look, I just can't take on one more, but I'll talk to you this one time and then, you know, but I can't I can't have a long-term mentoring relationship because I'm, I'm already doing eight or nine uh, mentor relationships here and I don't want to shortchange any of you. But more frequently, you're going to start a conversation that's going to work as a, as a, um, as a mentorship relationship. And it's an honor for people to be asked. Um, I've never, uh, I, I've, probably mentored maybe a dozen people over the years and it's always been a real I've learned as much from them as they've learned from me probably I have learned more um, but it's uh, it's an honor and a, a real uh, pleasure to be asked so don't be afraid of it um, but let it grow a little organically don't just go up to somebody you've never met before and say hey I'd like you to be my mentor because that's almost a little creepy but let a little time de to develop with email or text or whatever, and then move into it. It doesn't have to be formally announced to the world. It just has to be you know, a relationship you're comfortable with. Sorry, let's have that last question because I know I want to be respectful of people's yeah. times too. Yes, um, and, it's, and it's related to that, and, um, and I have an answer to it, and then I'll shift it to you so you can um, share your thoughts as well. Um, the question was, are there any sites that you would suggest where professionals can network and um, you know, ask questions. And you'd mentioned LinkedIn, and I want to mention um, opportunities through Rails. Um, I'm going to put a link uh, into the chat box for everyone. Um, you know, through Rails, there are uh, in-person networking events that we coordinate in the various areas. Um, we do it about once a month, and it's a really great opportunity to meet people in your area and, um, and talk about that. You can find that information on the Rails website. There's also networking groups. Gosh, there must be 20 or 30 of them spread out around the Rails service area. Um, you know, some of them are regional. Um, some of them are for library directors in the area. Some are for like reference staff in the area or tech staff. Um, you know, so those are um, groups that you can join and meet in person. And then we also have um, community forums through uh, Rails as well. And you know, those are also by region or by topic. And um, some of the 
forums are a little more active than others, but it's really a great place to say, you know, hey, I've got this problem, you know, what are you doing at your library? Um, do you have any suggestions, you know, kind of thing. So I just wanted to um, mention that. I don't know, George, if you have any other suggestions on places just one to more. do networking. Uh, one more, and that is the ALA Think Tank. Uh, ALA's Think Tank has all of the virtues and all of the vices of ALA, uh, which means it's a great place to meet a lot of librarians who have a lot of different ideas. The downside is that there are sometimes bizarre uh, Byzantine discussions and arguments that go on there. So you just have to pick and choose, but it's a good place to meet a lot of people who are very active in the profession and have a lot of great ideas. All right, that's great. And um, I, sorry, I have one more question. I know we're coming up close to the time. This is this will be the absolute last question. Okay. Um, George, do you have any do you have any recommendations for um, when you have when you're working with a staff member that needs discipline or reviews, and you know things start to improve and then start to slack off again? Um, well, there's a couple of things. One is um, uh, patience, you know, people are people, and anybody who's ever tried to lose 20 pounds, like I've lost the same 20 pounds three or four, five, 20 times in my life, uh, knows that the the thing, the change happens in fits and starts, and there's a, there's backsliding, and there's some times when there's real progress, and then there's times when there's not. If they're in a mission critical position, that uh, they really need to change, and they need to change permanently, uh, or or it's going to affect your mission within your institution. You might look for somebody. You might look for ways that you can complement that person's weaknesses that you see, uh, and and find somebody who has strengths to complement those weaknesses. We can work with them. What are your expectations of the person? Are they more than that person can actually handle? Um, if they are, then you might consider reassigning them or moving them into a different. Uh, position, uh, but I, I think that the being honest, being upfront, letting people know exactly what's expected of them within the institution uh, to, to, to meet those goals of the organization is critical, uh, and if you, if you can't have that kind of open communication, uh, you'll never, the, 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 the person will always have a fallback position because they can honestly say they just didn't know. So um, honesty, patience, uh, and looking for ways to complement their weaknesses, um, I think, are the three three things you can do in that sort of situation. All right. Well, um, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you so much, George, for doing this presentation today. Some people have been commenting that it was really informative and had some great points. And um, thank you also for letting us record today and sharing the slides. And I will share those with everybody as soon as possible. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Louise. I, I always enjoy working with Rails. You guys are great. Yeah, it's been great working with you too, too, George. Talk to you soon, and everybody, thanks for joining us today. Have a great day.